Hello and welcome to World Inside with Tian Wei, coming to you from Beijing on CGTN. Coming up on today's program, the Spanish autonomous region of Catalonia has voted to secede from Spain. How will this unilateral independence referendum affect Spain and Europe? And I interviewed the Chinese adventurer Ivan Xu, who crossed Siberia's frozen lake Bacau in winter. We find out what kept him going as the ice cracked around him. Spain has been jolted by the recent Catalonia independence referendum and the subsequent police action against the voters. The Spanish government and courts have declared the vote illegal. Catalans, some of them, came out onto the streets to condemn the police action, shutting down traffic, public transport and businesses, and stoking fears that they will intensify insurrection in a region that makes up one-fifth of the Spanish economy. What will happen next? Let's take a look at this first. Early on, they pushed up to the police lines, this time with a different message. In the heart of the Catalan capital, praise for the actions of the state this past week. Condemnation for this region's politicians who defied it. I believe Catalonia belongs to Spain. We used to live together without any problems. They should talk, but not until a regional government returns to legality. You have to follow the rules. You can't do uh, by your own because that's not democracy. Democracy is to sit and talk with the Spanish government and try to make a deal. If you can't make a deal, you can do what you want because that's not democracy. Many carried Spanish and Catalan flags, calling for unity and backing the government's chosen means of maintaining it. Though telling Spanish newspaper El País, he hopes it never comes to that. Esta también la vamos a superar. La clave es volver y hacerlo pronto a la legalidad. We will overcome this. We have to return to legality, and the key is to do so quickly and go back to normal. Have the absolute reassurance that the government will prevent any declaration of independence from turning into something. Spain will continue to be Spain, and it will continue being Spain for a long time. Not everyone here agrees with that approach. Yeah! Along the march, people from all over Spain, but also many Catalans. That was a sentiment often repeated by the hundreds of thousands who came. This man said he'd been afraid. There is a silent majority in Catalonia that don't protest. It makes no sense what the government here is doing. Outside the regional parliament, local law enforcement got a less welcome reception. As they protected the place where on Tuesday, Catalonia may unilaterally announce its independence. Even away from the main route, this city was awash with the national colours. They weren't there on voting day. They are speaking up now. Guy Henderson, CGTN, Barcelona. After the Catalan referendum, a Spain divided? Let's get some answers from our panelists. Joining us in Madrid is El Goodman, who is a freelance journalist in Spain. In London, we invited Nicholas White, Senior Director of Global Solutions in APCO Brussels office. He has more than two decades experience in international affairs. And gentlemen, I want to welcome the both of you. What exactly, gentlemen, is this issue that we are talking about here? Is it about sovereignty or is it about self-determination? Let's go to Mr. White first. Of course, uh, these two things are very, very closely aligned in the case of Catalonia, uh, where we have uh, a group of people who believe that they are a sovereign nation, they believe that they should be treated in that way, and that they should have the choice as to whether they exercise that sovereignty if as part of Spain, as they have been until now, or as an independent state. And mm -hmm. then the dispute is whether that is a group of people that has that right to make that choice mm -hmm. or not. At this point, Mr. Goodman, since you are based in Spain, we understand those voters in Catalonia go to the polls, actually only 40% of them, about the whole population. Many of them shied away from casting their vote, whether agree or not with this referendum. So is it going to be representative enough? Well, that is one of the questions, but in a big picture, you really have both sides in this debate. Mm -hmm. The Catalan leaders uh, based in Barcelona and the Spanish government leaders based in Madrid, they're both saying that they represent democracy. In Madrid, they say that they are representing the Spanish constitution and the rule of law, and they said that's what the basis of democracy in Spain is. 
and that's why Spain is a part of the European Union. But in Catalonia, they say they represent the people's right to vote and their right to self-determination. So you have a major uh, train crashing into each other right now with this issue. Mm -hmm. And as to why th that number of people came out on Sunday, October 1st, to vote, not all of the Catalans, well, because the Constitutional Court of Spain said that vote was illegal because mm. the, according to the Spanish Constitution, only all of Spain can decide if one part is going to break away and not just one part gets to decide that. So the Spanish government did everything it could to try to prevent that vote, but the Catalan leaders were able to carry off a portion of that vote at the same time, we see very strong attitude coming from the Spanish government, the central government. I mean, uh, for example, the king, for the very first time, coming out in public and talking about this is legality of uh, this so-called referendum, and he said it's totally illegal, and he's writing this letter. Meanwhile, the prime minister of Spain saying we're going to do everything we can to prevent that from happening. I mean, the separation of uh, Catalonia from Spain as a country. The question is, which one is going to represent so-called the, the people in Catalonia? First of all, it's important to say that the 42% turnout uh, in favor of uh, independence, that as 42% of the electorate, that would be a pretty good result for any political party in a European democracy. <laughs> uh, I know different places have got different standards for this kind of thing, but it, it's actually, you know, to get that percentage is, is, is quite a good result. And that then does raise the question of, um, you know, does the constitution constrain the wishes of the people? or should the constitution adapt itself to what people actually want. And in, in a lot of countries, um, there's some difficulty in understanding quite why the Spanish uh, position is, is as rigid as it is. Of course, this is driven partly by Spain's original, its, its own individual history. Um, but in, in many countries, for instance, I'm sitting here in London, where we, the, the mm. Scots had a referendum on independence not that long ago. Um, I live in Belgium, where we have an ongoing debate about the relationships between the different parts of the country, uh, which is carried out in a, in a peaceful and uh, productive and, uh, uh, and political way. So that's part of the, the, the issue in terms of international reaction. Mm. But in terms of Prime Minister Rajoy, we must remember that he has built his political career on trying to put the Catalans back into their box. He became Prime Minister essentially because he had led uh, a revolt in the rest of Spain mm. against the attempts by the Catalans to gain more autonomy ten years ago. Um, and so, you know, when you talk about him doing anything he could to prevent independence, uh, actually the one thing he didn't try was being nice to the Catalans, and that's something that may well have made a difference. However, when you think about the other cases in Europe, let's just say Crimea, mm -hmm. which is also an issue of whether separation, self-determination so-called, or sovereignty, at least for Russia. So. Yeah. Are we having different well, kinds of standards here? I, I personally advised the governments of Montenegro and Kosovo and South Sudan on their campaigns for independence before they became independent states. And the conclusion I've drawn from those experiences and from observing Catalonia is that indeed there are very few common standards, that uh, a different methodology is applied in every case. Mm. Um, so when we're looking at double standards, I think we're looking at multiple standards. In the case of Crimea, let me just make one point, and, uh, and then Mr. Goodman I think will have things to say as well. Uh, but on Crimea, they did not actually actually have a referendum on joining Russia, they had a referendum on separation from Ukraine and becoming an independent country. Mm. So the thing they voted for was the thing they did not actually get. All right. And Mr. Goodman, what about your view? Are we having same standard, double standard, or actually as Mr. White mentioned, actually we have multiple standards. It really depends on what case we're talking about. And therefore, are we being fair? Nicholas is talking about the pressures on Brussels and the European Union and these other independence movements outside of uh, different countries. But right here in Spain, mm. certainly one reason that Madrid is not interested in Catalonia going independent is because they suspect that if, if Catalonia was to go independent, were to go independent, then the rest of other regions of Spain, most notably the Basque region called the Basque Country, the three provinces in northern Spain, That's which right. had an armed separatist, many people called it a terrorist group called ETA, during decades, uh, which um, 
killed about 800 people in bombings and shootings, wounded more than 3,000. Mm. A horrible situation, not just in northern Spain, but in attacks all across Spain, including one of the biggest ones in Barcelona back in the year 1987. So finally, the Spanish government, with the help of many Basque leaders, have been able to stop ETA. ETA has laid down its arms. That terrible tragedy is basically finished. And so as Madrid now looks to Barcelona, which is clamoring for independence with the Catalans, um, they're thinking, we, we settled down the Basque issue up here in the north of Spain. We can't go that way. And it's not just those two regions. Overall, there are 17 regions right. that came up after Spain's constitution of 1978. Well, you know, Mr. Goodman, as you said, Spain has a complicated history. And so do many countries. So here it is why that an issue about sovereignty or so-called self-determination could always be so controversial. So let's take a look at some of the attitudes of the EU countries. From Brussels, uh, Mr. White, you have probably have noticed uh, the countries there said very clearly, if Catalonia tried to separate itself from Spain, so-called independent, EU is not going to give it automatic membership, which means they're not likely to enjoy any of the benefits that they, they are having right now. And by the way, Mr. White, as we know, the economy there is extremely important. That's why they want to separate from the rest of Spain, because they think they're having a lot of financial burdens for the rest of Spain. They're getting better off, but others not. Okay, if they're not part of the EU, yes. are they still really going to enjoy what they have argued, Mr. White? Yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, we must realize that people in Brussels are pretty pragmatic. At the moment, Spain is sitting in all of the meetings of all of the member states, and the Spanish have made it very clear that if any other country shows the Catalans even the slightest bit of sympathy, then that country can forget about Spanish support for any of their proposals at European level uh, for a very long time, and they will indeed face a Spanish veto. That's a very serious threat that Spain can capably make, uh, and for that reason you're not going to see uh, a move in advance to s support uh, the Catalan case from any of the European uh, countries that are in the EU. However, you know, if push came to shove, if there were, at some point, uh, it's not going to happen immediately, but if there were an ordered separation um, between Catalonia and Spain, then everybody will be pragmatic and will find a way of making the new situation work. It's interesting that Spain has already said that in the event of Scottish independence, mm. that Spain would not stand in the way of Scotland rejoining the European Union after the UK <laughs> as a whole has left. So mm. I think we have, to be, we have to be clear that there's an element of pragmatism uh, both right now in terms of dealing with Spain as a European partner and there will be in the future to deal with whatever situation may develop out of the, mm. current, uh, the current crisis. Mr. Goodman, is that also what you assume? Well, there is a lot of pragmatism, and uh, as you both know, the, the, the landscape in Spain and across Europe has changed so dramatically in terms of politics because really this latest independence move by Catalonia, and there have been several over the years, uh, this one can, can be dated back, many people dated back about 14 years, but clearly when Spain's economic recession hit uh, around 2008, 2009, and the unemployment went way up to around basically a fourth of the Spaniards were out of work. That's when you really saw a rise in independent sentiments. Before that, independent sentiments, according to the polls, had been around 11% when unemployment was still pretty low. When it got up to about 24, 25%, independent sentiments moved up to about 45%. And mm. then on top of that, speaking of the new pragmatism, what had been in Spain for decades, a basically a two-party system, the conservatives, and the socialists, That's right. and with uh, some dominant parties in the regions like the Convergence uh, and Unity Party in Catalonia, um, that all changed a few years ago with the emergence of some new parties, another party on the left called Podemos or We Can, and another party on the right called Citizens. And that has made for a coalition type uh, situation in the Spanish parliament in Madrid with a lot of pressure on the conservative prime minister who's in a minority, mm -hmm. he's got a minority government right now, and as well for the Catalan leader. He doesn't have a full majority over there. He's got to work with all these other people, and some of his partners want to have independence right now. All so right. it's a much more difficult landscape 
than just a few years ago. It's not a black and white situation. It's not a black and white situation in Spain. It's not a black and white situation in some of the other major European countries either. For example, Germany. For example, the UK. We all understand what's going on there, right, Mr. White? And for example, France. You all got the far left, the far right, with very extreme ideas about what should happen to the country. We see them coming into the parliament, national level, local level. A lot of things are happening. Is this going to be the very first of this so-called domino effect that we're seeing with the case study of Catalonia in Spain? Mr. White. Well, of course, we don't, we don't know what's going to emerge out of the current crisis, but we've already seen um, existing party systems being shattered by the forces of the, the, the global effects of politics and, and economics that we've just been discussing. Um, and if you're looking for an interesting domino uh, that has started the toppling, uh, I think we should look a little to the north of Spain and look at the election of President Macron in France. Mm. This was a man who did not have a political party, had no base of support a year before the election. And it came not quite out of nowhere because he was a known quantity, but created a new political force and has taken power. Uh, of course, it's not proving easy for him because it's not, a, it's not an easy situation. At the same time, you know, the old systems do have resilience. Uh, we still have a Conservative government in the UK. Chancellor Merkel um, managed to get re elected in Germany with, with lesser support. Mm. We're seeing the, the insurgency from the extremists not quite reaching the success that they were expecting in different countries. I would include also the recent elections in the Netherlands and Austria in right. that regard. So we're seeing a weakening of traditional politics, but it's not obvious to me that what comes next is necessarily worse. We're seeing an opening up, uh, openings being created for new forces, um, and that right. can be both good and, and it can be bad. The economy in these places, yeah. for example, Catalonia, as we mentioned earlier, it is a much well off part of Spain compared to the rest of the Spain. And one of the so-called political slogans coming from the Catalonian separatists was actually talking about uh, Madrid is ripping us off, meaning uh, letting the money flow out of Catalonia to the other parts of Spain. So Mr. Goodman, how strong is this economic sense in the so-called political decision? The economic argument way has been one of the key arguments through the years going back a decade or more. And there were various attempts unsuccessful for Catalonia to be able to keep more of their tax money because they're a net contributor to the rest of Spain. They were looking to the Basque region which collects its own taxes. Catalonia wanted that power. Madrid wouldn't give them that power. So the, the economy has been a huge argument and it, when you, I have friends in Catalonia, this is something they talk about. But more recently, and especially after Sunday, October's first voting with the Spanish National Police and the Spanish Civil Guards keeping people away from the polling places, taking the ballot boxes out, mm. uh, more than 800 people injured, most of them not too seriously, but just this whole idea that a police force from elsewhere in Spain would be there trying to prevent a vote, that has become much more of an emotional argument now. Mm. And I would say that right now, that pride um, is the key more important than the economic arguments. And it doesn't just end with the economy. There's debt issues. Talk about the debt. Yes, we are seeing Catalonia as a region doing very well economically, Mr. White, but it has enormous amount of debt. And the debt is actually in the hands of the Spanish government. So how shall we see the so-called mm -hmm. well-off economic situation mm -hmm. of <coughs> Catalonia? Yeah, I mean, of course, we're looking at a slightly theoretical situation here, and Catalan independence doesn't look like it's, uh, no. you know, whatever, whatever people are arguing about, it's not something that's going to happen in the mm. coming week, is it? Um, and and the, uh, the fact is the historical precedence for how debt is handled in a situation like this, they are pretty clear. We talked about multiple standards earlier, but this is a case where there, there is really a single standard, which is that you come to a political agreement between the two regions concerned. And the Catalan argument, as I understand it, is that in fact, so much of their debt is tied up with the relationship with Spain and with their, their, their lack of control over their own revenue mm. that they reckon they could come to a, a reasonably equitable settlement. It is worth saying that, you know, the, the, the tax raising issue that, uh, that Al Goodman just referred to, that is really important and it's one of the areas where I think if there had been more flexibility shown on that from Madrid at an early stage, uh, then I think we would not have reached the situation that we're currently in. Mm. But we still have to ask this question. You know, for those 
with the rest of us in the rest of the world. How are we going to deal with issues like this? Let's go to Mr. Goodman first. You know, I think the short answer their way would be Spain would see itself much worse off and Catalan, the, the people in Catalonia who are in favor of independence, which is certainly not all of them, not 90% according to all the polls, not at all. Um, they would say that they would be better off. Uh, but the, uh, one of the key things here is it's mainly been the Catalan leaders who've been appealing to the world. And you listen to their speeches. Um, uh, any number of the very top leaders and the middle leaders, they're all saying, look how the world is looking at us now. The, the, these images are going out to the world. The world is paying attention. They want the implication. They want the participation from the European Union and beyond. President Trump has talked about this when uh, the Prime Minister of Spain, Mr. Rajoy, was at the White House just a short while ago. Mm. So you're getting the, and the, the, the American administration is saying they want a strong and united Spain. That's not really a change in policy. But you're seeing the, the Catalans appealing to the outside world. And I would just make this point. I'm sure Nick, uh, Mr. White is, would, might agree with this. You have human leaders right. <laughs> involved. And you've, because it's come to such, uh, such a point right now, any miscalculation on the part of Barcelona or Madrid could have very, very serious consequences for a long time to come. And that's really one of the unknowns is what's going to happen. Um, how are they going to try to get past this next stage? Mm. Right? Mr. White, final words from you too. I think, I think if we're looking for global standards, we should insist as far as we can that processes should be peaceful and nonviolent and that uh, people should engage in dialogue with the other side, even if that sometimes seems to be difficult. As, as Nelson Mandela put it, um, it's very easy to talk to your friends. The difficult thing is to talk to the people you don't agree with. Mm. And I think we should bear that in mind and not, make, not prejudge local situations, which we ourselves may not know all that much about. Exactly. It is exactly the sh purpose of our show today to have a fair discussion about what's going on. Well, at the same time, we should really leave the decisions to the people there to decide on their own fate in Spain and in Catalonia, of course. And thank you for both of you, Al Goodman and Nicholas White. Really appreciate it, gentlemen, for being with us. And you are watching World Insight with Tianwei. Still to come on our program. I interviewed the you Chinese adventurer. Ivan Xu crossed the Siberia's Lake Macau solo in winter. We find out how his amazing journey has inspired Chinese youth to explore and conquer. Have you ever imagined that someone could walk across Lake Pacao solo without any mechanical support? Well, this mission, impossible, has been accomplished by a young Chinese man. Xu Jiangjun, or Ivan Xu, spent 23 days walking 700 kilometers through the sub-zero wilderness. He was the eighth person ever to have crossed the frozen lake from the south to the north. Before he went on his icy trip, he biked through over 36 countries in Asia, Africa, and Europe. His other feats include riding across the U.S. and traversing the Caucasus Mountains. Born in the 1980s, she has become a model of adventure among the Chinese youth. Tell me about that trip. Uh, so in the past winter, I went to uh, Siberia, Russia. I was there for about three months and I was preparing uh, for the biggest trip in my life, which uh, was to travel across Baikal from south to north for almost 700 uh, kilometers. And yeah, I prepared for like 45 days in Siberia, and then I walked uh, 23 days across Baikal. So that was really exciting. At the very beginning, yeah. Jiang Jun, you were traveling with the Russian guy. Yeah. He was supposed to be your guide, while at the same time providing support to you. 
Uh, he was more like a travel companion. I he, see. He is. He wasn't really my guide because he had the same idea and same dream to traverse Baikal. He said uh, it's a great trip and adventure for our Siberian men. How did do. you find him? Uh, through a common friend uh, whose name is uh, Cozy. Uh, before I went to Russia in July, uh, I Skyped with Fyodor four times and I can sense that he really likes adventure and he, re he knows Baikal really well. He understands code, code travel very well and he's very no profile. Mm. And that's what I like the most because I think as a travel companion uh, in the very uh, harsh conditions like Lake Baikal in winter. Yeah. I think it's very important that you have a uh, no profile personality because if you, if you just want to be famous then that's not that's not uh, a good start because if you're trying to be a hero and that's dangerous you, mm. you may not judge very well. Uh, but if you just love adventure and love the idea to travel across Baikal itself I think that's more like a good companion uh, to go with because try to be a hero is dangerous. Try, try to just live another life. That's, I think that's the key. So you didn't want to be a hero? Well, this is what I want to do. I mean, you know, that's not my goal to become a hero. It's, it's just my the dream The trip to do itself. It. Yeah. But then your travel companion mm -hmm. forgot to bring his snow goggles. Mm -hmm. As a result, he became slow blind. Yeah. And he has to quit. Mm-hmm. But at the very beginning, you were trying to provide him with your own snow goggles so that he could survive the trip. It didn't work out. Uh, I think he, I think he kind of underestimated uh, you know, the trip on Baikal because I think he understands slow blindness really well mm. uh, because he's also a mountaineer guide, which means he goes to the mountain. He guides people to the mountain very often, so he knows the situation very well, and he has the same problem before only in the mountains. Yeah. And in Baikal, usually in March, uh, in the southern part of Baikal, usually it's more of ice. So everything is ice. It's not really slow. Mm -hmm. But this year in March, the first six days, it slowed really heavy every day, like five days out of six. I see. So everywhere is white. And that's just kind of very abnormal this year. This well, year. you give him the snow goggle. Uh, Did you realize that you are probably the one that's likely to also suffer from snow blind as a result of it? I knew the situation of snow blind before, so I prepared really well. I mm. have two pair of uh, glasses. I one see. is sunglasses, one is goggle. So I can, I can lend him, I can, I can uh, lend him my goggle and keep my sunglasses. It also can protect my eyes. But at the time he was suffering too much, he had to quit. Mm -hmm. That meant you have to be alone, right. only on your own, right. from then on. Right. What was it like? <laughs> I didn't really uh, wish that he quit. I wished he uh, would go with me of because course. he's really experienced and he's really strong, as strong as a bear, I would say. <laughs> because Did he know that analogy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think he knew that. Because before our trip, I went for a hike and camping trip with him in a Siberian forest called Taiga. Yeah. Yeah, he carried really big, heavy backpack and still walked faster than me. And that was just unbelievable. And his knowledge uh, on how to survive in the cold is also really amazing. Mm. So I think he trains me a lot and he's really strong and he knows back home really well. What did he train you about? Uh, like different things. For example, when we were walking in, in the Siberian forest, when we go downhills, like he walked really fast. Like from from a, a like a, a top of a small mountain to the bottom, really fast, and then walk yes. really slow. Like he would yell at the bottom of the mountain. <laughs> he said, "Ivan, be fast. Your brain is is smarter than your legs. Just but walk." But that's not training. That's that's urging. Well, you know, his training is very different. His training <laughs> is very harsh. It's it's not. It's not very fun that he is your, you know, is your trainer or helps tough you. Tough love, I guess. Yes, very, very tough love. You know, <laughs> it's, you, know you, you, you love him afterwards. Yeah. But when you are training with him, you hate him, you know. So that was a really scary moment when he said maybe he cannot uh, go with me anymore because his eyes just, he had double vision when he seen things. He That's really two. problematic. Yeah. yeah, and he felt like there, there were sand uh, in his eyes. He has to quit, and that was a very scary moment because 
I always want to go with a Russian partner for this trip because I'm not very confident in, in code, especially on the ice. Ruth是很好,其实让他很非常痛,所以他昨天早上打车回耶尔库斯克,然后刚刚因为得到了二红岛真的是有手机信号的,刚刚跟他通电话他说他眼睛比较严重,需要不少于几天的休息时间,所以
Uh, there's nothing. It's very flat on, on the lake. That's so right. So it's very, very windy. It's very scary because if your tent is blown away, then you're done. You're it's done, yeah. And also there was ice under you. Yeah. And yet there are huge cracks. You could heard, you could hear the sound of the cracks. Yeah. While you were sleeping. Yeah, yeah. It must yeah. be sweet dreams, I guess, for that <laughs> night. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think that was maybe something like day 20. Uh, mm -hmm. I was camping on the ice. Uh, when you're on the ice, you, know, you can hear the sound of ice cracking. And usually for people who go there for the first few times, it's really, really scary. But you know, that fear is just, just your, your instinct. But you never know. Um, you never know, yeah. There is a chance that you, you were crack very big, you were fall into the water, but the chance is small if, mm -hmm. you read, uh, if you read other people's experience. You know. But how did you fight against your fear? I mean, you have to go to sleep because you have a whole day to go the mm -hmm. next day. I took the prevention. I think I bought uh, earplugs. earplugs. It says Does it work? It says the best earplugs <laughs> in the world. <laughs> So when I get scared, on the lake of a cow, right? On the lake of a cow, yeah. So when I feel scared, I just put the the world's best earplugs <laughs> there, and then I don't hear it so much noise, but it's still scary. Yeah. And then I told myself, this is irrational fear. You just don't think about it. You're gonna be fine. You know, if if the ice is gonna crack for real, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. Just. How did you fight loneliness besides talking to your unprofessional camera? <laughs> um, so I have audiobooks in my phone yeah. that I listen sometimes. What kind of books? All kinds of uh, stories that I feel uh, that I can learn, learn lessons from other people. Uh, this is also keep me sane, mm -hmm. so you know, my, my brain's active. Which any of those stories really you want to listen over and over again? Uh, it's about Einstein. Einstein? Yeah, yeah. So Einstein kept you walking. Yeah, and also I mean, on the lake is really beautiful. That's Some right. parts was incredible, incredibly beautiful, and I've never seen things like that. The shore or mountains covered with snow, and the sunset and sunrise usually are incredibly beautiful. Yeah. And you know, there's no other people, just me. Just right. Just me uh, that I can, I can, I can enjoy the view. So that's your world. That's my reward. Actually, uh, most of the time I don't really have, I don't really spend a lot of time to enjoy to savor, to savor the the sunset. Um, because, because I only have uh, limited daytime. I was trying to cover more distance. Yes. And, uh, I, and I, when I stop, I camp. So I don't really have a lot of time to do that usually. But when something really beautiful, I stop. You know, I took my uh, thermal bottle, I drink some tea, I eat some snacks, and then I, I enjoy that. How can you, at the same time, so elevated by the fact that you are there and the world on the lake of Bacal with that beautiful sunrise and sunset, mm -hmm. all yours. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, keep your posture mm -hmm. very calm. I just don't know how it worked out. Mm -hmm. Help me to understand it. Uh, like I said, before I went, uh, before I started my trip, uh, Fyodor told me, don't try to be a hero. Uh, just try to live another life. Yeah. Uh, that's very important uh, because you, you, don't really, you don't really get um, so excited because the view every day, every day the view is pretty much great. So you don't get overly excited. Yeah. Do you think you're responsible for your family when you are making all of those decisions? Mm -hmm. For me, for me, it's very important to keep a balance, a good balance to um, to to pursue my dream and also go home safe. Uh, that's that's a balance. That's a, that's a balance which is very hard to keep sometimes. But that's the balance I try to keep. You know, you are becoming this rising star in China in terms of doing adventures. I may wonder how is that shaping your idea about yourself and your ideas about what to do for the future and why you are going to do it. I think uh, doing adventures and going so many places. Uh, I think it gave me, it, it makes me want to become a better person, uh, want to be a good person. Uh, the reason I would say that is, for example, when I was in Baikal, 
when I was in Russia, Siberia, uh, many people helped me. For example, the hostel I stayed uh, before my trip, I stayed there 45 days. The hostel owner uh, told me I don't have to pay mm -hmm. because he supports what I do and he believes what I do has a lot of values, can inspire people. Oh. And for example, um, people in Russia, people give me free gears that they think I need, give me socks, mm -hmm. uh, give me some clothes. They think I might be able to use it. People lend me their sled. I right. think it's uh, very useful to, to, to have in Baikal. So many people helped me because Siberia is a place where they have very large land, but they have very few people. And it's a very harsh place when it's really cold in winter. So it's really hard to survive alone in Siberia. Mm -hmm. uh, so they ha people have the habits to help each other, help strangers in right. Siberia. Many places in America, in Europe, everywhere. And in, in Azerbaijan, in Georgia, the places I traveled, uh, people helped me. And the only way, and I, I, I will probably never meet these people again, the only way that I can repay them, the only way I can repay them is to pay it forward, you know, to, to become a good person. Xu Jiangjun, a young Chinese adventurer on the Lake Bacow. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us, World Inside CGTN, in your search engine. Or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From me, Tianwei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. And tune in again next time for Insight across China and around the world. Good night.